Make sure we're muted. All right, hello everybody and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is our final lecture of the semester and we're so happy everyone was able to come. Can you see my slide okay? Yep, you're all good. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And again, welcome. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody to have your mics on mute, um, as well as feel free to leave your cameras on and add your med school or your university to your bio so we can see where everyone's coming in from. Also nice if we can um, see your school and where you're tuning in from. Um, Someone might have their mic on mute. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Just a reminder to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We have our info right there. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to be announcing our lineup for the spring semester shortly, and that'll be the first place to look to get that information. So for those new to GOMI, just a quick uh, summary of our mission here. Uh, we work to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine. Our goal is to showcase diverse spheres in which physicians and healthcare professionals can really uh, work together, impact inspires others to think about abstract ways to utilize our degrees in healthcare and medicine. And we're working to create this international community all based around wilderness medicine. So here's our fall lineup that we've gone through. And again, today's our last one of the semester and we're super excited to be presenting on ski medicine. Um, for next semester, we have to look forward to topics such That's as an medicine and mountain medicine and more. Something in particular to look forward to and keep on your calendars is January 20th, where we'll be doing a joint um, presentation with Survival Med to do BLS, D BWLS certifications. Um, so stay tuned on our social media or on our website to get more information on that. And again, that'll be January 20th. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Eddie Albert. Dr. Eddie Albert is a rural and remote generalist based in Tasmania, Australia. He works with the aeromedical retrieval team of the Royal Flying Doctors Service in Central Australia. Previously, he has worked as a doctor in Antarctica and has spent 10 winters as a ski resort doctor. Additionally, he acted as the founding director of the pre-hospital care charity in Sandpiper, Australia. Currently, Dr. Albert is the director of the Healthcare and Remote and Extreme Environments program at the University of Tasmania. In his free time, he enjoys traveling, climbing, kayaking, skiing, and sailing. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Albert. And without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina, for inviting me and Catherine for helping facilitate that. It's funny looking at a bio and here we are, yeah, 18 months plus into COVID and apparently I enjoy traveling. Uh, I, I don't remember doing much of that recently, but let, let's hope we can get cracking on that. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, I hope that will work okay. Uh, please let me know if it doesn't. Uh, it's, I think it's always quite good to be a little bit different. You know, working in Australia, you might expect me to do something on shark bites or jellyfish or snakes or spiders or stuff. But no, let's, let's be a bit different and do something on skiing. Uh, so if, as, as mentioned, I've done 10 winters at Perisher Ski Resort. And it's perhaps hard to imagine for some of you to even believe that Australia does have skiing, but we do. Uh, and of course, while I'm not going to compare our skiing to perhaps Telluride or Whistler, or Val d'Isere or Zermatt, uh, in a sense, from our perspective, it's the quality of the injuries that counts, perhaps rather than the, the vertical drop at the ski resort. So, for some reason, I have, my slides are frozen. There we go. So first thing, I think there may be a few people here who've actually done a little bit of, uh, of this sort of stuff or, or thinking about it. And there's perhaps a, a tendency to imagine that ski medicine is just one thing. But of course, the models of care that we, we use are context dependent. So how big is the resort? 
So what size of medical facility can you have? What staffing is actually needed? The geography, so how do those resorts interact with each other and to other hospitals or tertiary receiving facilities? Again, depending on where that resort is, we're looking at embedded versus standalone care. So in other words, are there people there year round and you're just ramping up uh, the, you know, the, the resort services through the winter or perhaps these days uh, in the summer for mountain biking because there's a, certainly a lot of ski resort areas are used for mountain biking uh, in the summer. That's become very popular. Or are we looking at a resort that's really quite remote and has a sort of standalone seasonal service that's set up and then disappears when the snow melts? Transport options also determine what sort of level of care you're going to provide. If transport's quick and easy uh, to an established facility, you're probably going to do less on the slopes. Uh, if you're quite remote, you're probably going to be doing more. And then what sort of public, private or insurance based type of, of of model is used to sort of fund the care is again going to depend on what equipment, what sort of staffing, what sort of type of practice. So there isn't a correct way to set up and run a service. Yeah, and as as examples of that, uh, I don't know if people have seen the, the the film The Horn. If you haven't, it's fabulous. It gives you great insight in how to set up and, and how a service would run. Yeah, extracting remote people from remote, high glaciated areas around the Matterhorn. So a very, very specific, well-purposed service to do a well-purposed job. Closer to home for me over in New Zealand, let's look at Mount Hutt. It's not actually that far west of Christchurch, which you know, has a large hospital. Uh, it's a fairly small resort uh, and there's a, very, a standalone service that just sets up in the winter, does really sort of advanced first aid and uh, perhaps a little bit more and shuttles a lot of people down the hill. Uh, in contrast, take somewhere like Val d'Isère in France, where you've got a large community living year round. So the medical service is, is going to ramp up in the winter. It's going to be busy in the summer with, with summer tourists. Uh, and the facility is going to you know, include primary care as well as emergency care. So three very different areas providing three differently structured services. And for us in New South Wales, Perish is actually the largest resort in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, on a busy weekend day, we can get up to 10,000 people on the slopes. And that equates to yeah, overall, we'll see between 20 to 70 patients a day. Of course, that's very much weather dependent uh, and, and the day of the week. And of course, when school holidays are. So we have a seasonal service. Um, some people live in the resort, a lot drive up and down from the nearest village to ski and, and to, to work. Um, and there's fairly long distances to definitive care. We have huge resource limitations in terms of ambulance and helicopters uh, because these are publicly funded in Australia rather than uh, insurance or privately funded as in other countries. The maritime influence climate means that we do get bouts of really poor weather where flying simply isn't an option. And the other thing, which I really won't go into the details of because it might just bore you to tears, is that we're, we, we basically work as any other family medicine or general practice in terms of of billing, Medicare, what we can and what we can't uh, do. And that has a huge impact on how we set the clinic up. A quick map, for those of you a bit more familiar with Australia, um, that will make some sort of sense to you. For those that aren't, where it says Threadbow, if you drive eight hours south, you'll get to Melbourne. Uh, where it says Canberra, if you drive three hours north, you'll get to Sydney. So we're in the deep in the heart of Kosciuszko National Park in the Snowy Mountains. The peaks get up to about 2,200 metres, uh, which again is not, is not huge by any standard, but is enough to provide us with good skiing in the winter. Jindabyne's our nearest village just down the hill, but really has no services better than what we have uh, in Perisher or in Threadbow. Coombe is a small GP run hospital. Uh, it, it can provide somewhere to put bed people overnight uh, for observation, uh, perhaps for a CT to clear a head or a neck, most of which we actually do clinically. Uh, and then it's, it's two and a half hours by road up to Canberra. And even Canberra doesn't have a full range of tertiary services. So we structure the care that we provide very much on those sort of transport options uh, and what other care is, is around us. So it's seasonal. Uh, we have doctors and nurses that work in Jindabyne Village and then open the clinics up. We typically run two doctors, two nurses and a radiographer. There's a lot of multitasking. 
Uh, we do all the cleaning and, and all the billing and, and, and everything. We, we fix everything. Uh, so you can't just expect to turn up as a doctor and be weighted on hand and foot by everybody else. We also have a physiotherapist, which is great for kind of sharing management plans, uh, sharing reviews of patients. We couldn't manage without our portable machine. So we all have additional x-ray training uh, in, in x-ray, taking x-rays and interpreting uh, and don't e immediately have access to a radiologist to report our films. We do have ultrasound, but that's that's not something I found that's been particularly useful for us up there in decision making. And I'll, I'll, that will probably become clear when you sort of see what we're doing. Beers block is our standard go-to for for anaesthetics, and we have very minimal point of care testing simply because there's no there's no real need for it, but no way of of funding and recouping the outlay for that for that equipment. Uh, we open up at nine, and then we shut when we've dealt with the last people who've come off the slopes. So it's kind of interesting blend. We do a lot of emergency stuff, but for people living, working in, in Perisher, uh, we do quite a bit of definitive care. So any sort of fractures that don't need metal work, uh, we'll typically look after through the whole, that whole uh, journey through healthcare. We'll, we'll basically work as our own sort of fracture clinic. So we kind of come with a background in general practice or family medicine, obviously some emergency medicine. We blend that with a bit of sports medicine for some of the athletes that we see. Uh, and when we're looking at working with our physios to do some rehab and get people back working, uh, obviously a bit of orthopedics. Plastics is useful in the sense that you get some pretty nasty cuts from ski and board edges and being able to actually do some advanced sort of suturing and wound repair is really, really helpful. Basically single limb in injuries uh, uh, and acute GP type presentations, anything from a forgotten pill script to an STI, to somebody you know, presenting with chest pain, AF. Uh, we've thrombolized a couple of people over my time in the clinic uh, and been out onto the slopes for the odd arrest. Very much multidisciplinary, uh, working with ski patrollers, paramedics that have good, good quality on slope skills, uh, nurses, radiographer, physio, and a pharmacy. The clinic, we, we could do with a better clinic, but, but we make it work. It's very much purpose built, purpose or purposely organized. Uh, you can see our little baby resus bay in the corner that might horrify those of you used to a large metropolitan center, but it's all the space we've got and we make it work. Um, spinning around the other way, the, the clinic looks very empty. This was the beginning of our first COVID season when we had to strip out most of the beds. Uh, this can end up being a very full, very chaotic area. The x-ray room doesn't look anything flash. It just doesn't need to be. We just have a good quality radiographer, a decent portable machine. And given that we don't have II, like in a theater, we will actually do you know, some tweaking and some pulling uh, of fractures in here and just shooting laterals to make sure we're, we're happy uh, with what we're doing. Little GP room, we don't use it much, mainly for book work and paperwork. So why do I keep going back? And some of these pictures might surprise you. I, I'm not going to pretend for one minute that this is uh, like some of the North American or European or resorts. Uh, but on the left, you don't have to go far uh, into the side country to get first tracks. You can go back country. The, the top two pictures, uh, the one on the left was a, an overnight trip I did uh, camping on my own, showing some pretty steep skiing that we have. Uh, and on the right, a day trip out to Blue Lake, where there's a little bit of ice climbing. And there's just some fantastic terrain that's very, very different from anywhere else I've skied. Bottom right actually shows what we have in resort. Uh, and then the bottom, the bottom in the middle, we're looking down one of the main chairlifts uh, back into the resort. We, we tend, don't have any gondolas because it's generally too windy. So we rely a lot on, on chairlifts and there's quite a few old fashioned tea bars because you can keep those going when the weather's not so good. I think for me, it's been a fabulous place to work because it's informality. Uh, often I go to a hospital to work and I don't have much in common with the people that I find in the department uh, or in the clinic, but here you kind of get on with everyone. We're all there for the same sort of reason. Uh, very good multidisciplinary teamwork a lot of fun, a lot of informality. And I think, you know, one for me, one of the things is, is the positivity of the patients. They want to get better. They don't want time off work. 
They don't want repeat scripts for for opiates. They they can look after themselves. They can help each other. It's just a very positive environment, even though these people are injured. And this is the chef at the bottom left, one of the hotels. Uh, he did a tip fib. We've pulled him, plastered him, but I'm now waiting three hours for an ambulance uh, after the clinic shut. And we're both hungry. We're both thirsty. He's not going to go to theatre tonight. So look, just get him a beer, get him some dinner, sit down and have a bit of a chat. And then, of course, best of all, I get to work with my wife. Uh, and every so often we run out into the snow and do snow angels and so throw snowballs at patients. And then we run back in again. And as, as a generalist doctor rather than a specialist one, it's actually been quite nice to, to develop a little area of specialty uh, around alpine sports medicine, braces, plastering, fracture management, dislocations, uh, wound management. So beginning to develop a skill set that, or that, 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 that actually works for what you need, I think is part of preparing yourself to go and work in the, in the ski fields. So let's look at some specific stuff, some epidemiology. Most of the articles you read will cite three to five injuries per thousand days of skiing or boarding. Uh, there was a paper came out uh, earlier this year that was more like four to six and suggested that boarding, boarding was a bit more injury uh, injurious, shall we say, than skiing. But really, you've got to look down, dig down. So the children, beginners and the elite are the ones that, that injure themselves uh, most most likely, I'm not a child, I'm not a beginner, and I'm not elite, so I'm feeling pretty confident that I'm, I'm pretty safe. Snow conditions, so, you know, we get, as I said, maritime climate, we can get very heavy snow, and that can provide problems for skiers who are just not very experienced and very, not very strong. We get a lot of knee injuries. We get a lot of freeze thaw uh, and then periods without snow, so we can have bulletproof, really hard uh, conditions, and that's just fabulous for breaking wrists. Protective equipment's worth talking about because that will reduce some types of injuries. There's very good evidence for risk guards, particularly in beginner snowboarders, for preventing or reducing the risks of wrist fracture. There's a lot of myths still out there, and we'll still see higher companies and instructors believing that risk guards just simply allow you to break further up the arm. Uh, and in the, my 10 winters, in, in, in the thousands that we've, we've seen, you know, that is isn't true. If you look at the literature, that isn't true either. So, so risk guards won't prevent all wrist fractures, but they will reduce severity and they will certainly reduce the number of fractures. Helmets are a little bit misunderstood. Uh, they are sort of mandated in some places and certainly in children. They gr I mean, I wear one. They're great for pre preventing you know, abrasions, scratches, wounds, that sort of thing. You know, the whole idea of having the top of your head taken off by a tree or somebody else's ski edge is enough for me to wear a helmet but be aware they don't reduce traumatic brain injury and they certainly don't reduce the incidence of death because there's a limit to what helmets can actually do in terms of absorbing energy and as soon as you get into a decent skiing speed you're you're over the ability of that helmet to protect you from uh, from um from brain injury there's what i call the queensland factor this isn't in the in, in the literature but I think we see an increased number of injuries, I'm convinced by Queenslanders who've never seen snow, don't know how to do deal with it, don't know what to do with it. But because they surf, they think they can snowboard and don't realize that you use the front foot to ski on a snowboard rather than the back foot as you do surfing. Uh, so they're, they're, they're fabulous. They've, they've probably paid my bar bill and, and my, um, my retirement savings over the years. And then the senior skiers, like I've said, working is fabulous uh, it, from a ski in the ski resorts because the people are so good and often you know you, you work in a hospital you just see the, the worst of the elderly the people that haven't made it into good health in their older years you get to a ski resort and there's people in their 60s 70s and still 80s still skiing and, and that's just fabulous to see but they are still fragile more fragile than they were and they are at higher risk of injury so things to have in your head as you get on onto a, into a sports uh, alpine sports medicine setting. Firstly, really listen to the other professionals. There's going to be people there that have done winter after winter, and they may not have the medical knowledge that you do, but they've seen stuff time and time again. Uh, so listen to them. On the contrary, don't 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 forget about continuation bias and be prepared to reevaluate what you're seeing. 
mechanism of injury is hugely important. And particularly if we find with the jumps and the terrain park, people are, people are videoing all the time. Getting a look at that video uh, material can be really quite useful in trying to work out what's happened. Injury patterns by age group I'll come to. Again, important to understand that sort of dis pattern of, of, of injury by age group so that you're not chasing the wrong diagnosis or chasing the wrong injury. We'll see a lot of high energy impacts uh, compared to perhaps seeing people who've tripped and fallen over in an emergency room or emergency department. Generally, single limb, single system injuries, but not always. So be prepared to see people with multiple injuries and be able to do a sort of full resus. And the other thing is we're looking generally at physiologically normal people. Uh, uh, pain relief's a particular bugbear of mine when people just don't get enough pain relief. We're not dealing with elderly ladies with renal and hepatic dysfunction uh, with a little bit of bellyache who are likely to have tunned with a small amount of morphine. Physiologically normal people with significant injuries need proper analgesia. So thinking about those patterns as you're assessing patients, shoulders and knees are probably two of the big areas. You know, I'm not going to go through every possible injury and how to assess and how to manage. What I'm trying to do is work on the, some sort of assumption that you've, you've got some of those basics nailed. And I'm just going to pull out some things that are perhaps specific to dealing with the sort of injuries that we see regularly. Children don't dislocate their shoulders very often. The time they get into their middle eight teens, they start to, and if they do it early, they're likely to do it recurrently. The older you get, the less likely you are to dislocate. Uh, but if you do, you're more likely to have a fracture associated. And then the older you get, the more likely you are to see a neck of humerus fracture rather than a dislocation. So that's very much going to you know, help you guide your management and your imaging. Again, knees, children, and, and adults behave very differently. If you think about a ski, it's a huge big lollipop stick strapped to your boot, uh, and it can create huge amounts of torque. Children tend when they twist to get a boot top fracture. These are very different from the tibial fractures that you will see in an adult. And they may be quite subtle uh, with very little swelling, but you need to be aware and think about them and don't have a pattern of arc. Oh, you know, what you think of a tib fib fracture in an adult. ACL injuries become more common as you get older. Occasionally we see them in teenagers, it's still uncommon. And then certainly into adult, adult and then older adulthood. Tibial plateau fractures, again, it's a bit like the neck of humerus thing. We see them increasingly as people tend to get older. <clears throat> MCL injuries will occur right through the spectrum, but again, less, less so in the elderly who are more likely to break something. So having those kind of patterns can help guide your, your management. We go to med school and we get taught about Occam's razor, that whole concept really of, of trying to distill your history and your examination into one explicable diagnosis. And with knees and shoulders, it, that doesn't work. There can be really any combination of within knees, medial collateral, anterior cruciate, meniscal, tibial plateau, and a whole host of other injuries that you never knew existed until you read an MRI record. Shoulders very sim similar. You know, if you've got a dislocation, particularly in older people, go looking for those fractures. Yeah, and again, in older people, you wanna be thinking about more advanced imaging uh, to follow up because they're more likely to have injuries associated with their dislocation. So don't just get stuck on one diagnosis and forget the others. Knees, you know, we get taught to sort of take a history, examine a knee, and then come to a, a hypothesis about what's wrong and do some investigations. I think with trauma, with a hemarthrosis, if it's there, it's a fracture until proven otherwise. It needs an X-ray. If it isn't, it's probably an ACL. And then a big mistake is to give ACLs a back slab or a, or a splint and some crutches. The reality is that that's the worst thing you can do. If all they have is an ACL rupture without a fracture, you actually want the opposite. You want them using their legs. You want them using their muscles because muscle weakness and DVT are, are both high risk outcomes for people with an ACL injury. If you are thinking about an ACL, things are a bit different in a ski resort from the average emergency room setting. You're seeing them fresh. So there's often no effusion, uh, or it may develop while they're in the clinic. I think if you're not used to examining knees, uh, rely on your history more than your exam. 
trying to assess a knee for an ACL endpoint can be very difficult. You need your patient flat. You need them relaxed. You need to get a lot of knees in your hand bank, if you like. Compare with the other side. It's very easy early on to think, oh, I've got an endpoint when you haven't, or vice versa. Whereas that history of a slow speed twist, a snap, or a pop, the pain's often severe to start with as it ruptures and then it eases off. If you get that cluster, but you're not sure what you're doing exam wise, x ray it and assume it's an ACL because it probably is. The great thing again, with an x-ray, sometimes you'll pick up a Sagon fracture, and that's the x-ray on the top. When you see that little fracture there, the fracture itself really doesn't matter, but it's indicative that the ACL is already gone. And then the other thing is if you think you have got an ACL and you're convinced of it, still get an x-ray because you may have what you're seeing at the bottom, which is a tibial spine fracture. And your initial management of that, obviously, is non-weight-bearing x-ray and CT and orthopedic follow-up as opposed to the ACL where you actually want the weight bearing and moving around. So that's perhaps a different approach from what you were taught that's going to rely on, on the sort of subtleties of the history and imaging rather than this idea that you can just somehow feel an endpoint when you've really only done it once before and you're not really sure what you're feeling. MCLs are interesting. They either gap or they don't. Uh, and don't forget, you've got two uh, femoral attachments. So you want to examine at about 15 degrees and with the knee straight, because you may miss one of the heads. One of the other little things to be aware of when you're trying to assess an MCL for, for gapping is it's very easy to internally rotate the thigh uh, by accident and convince yourself you've got gapping. So just make sure that, that that thigh is actually not moving and that the gapping you're feeling is real. And if you do, they need to go into a ROM brace. Uh, otherwise, you end up with a, an MCL that heals long and floppy, is unstable and may need surgery. Shoulders, you want to do think about doing a functional exam. Pain and weakness are different. The number of times I hear, say, oh, they've got pain, they can't do that. No, pain and weakness are different, um, particularly in the over 40s. Rotator cuff injury becomes increasingly common. So follow up for ultrasound, MRI, whatever you have available where you're working uh, makes sense, whereas it probably doesn't in the younger people. We typically reduce the shoulder before x-ray. We do that for a number of reasons. We have young patients and the literature shows that you're around about one to 2% fracture rate. Uh, it's quicker, it's easier, the quicker you get it done. It doesn't clutter up the x-ray room we'd get probably more than 90% of our shoulders back in within two minutes of them getting into the clinic, and then we'll x-ray afterwards. There's, a, there's around about 20 different methods and, and variations on shoulder reduction. So nail one method and use it. Don't forget about neuro, neuro, you know, neuro, neurological stuff. People sometimes say, oh, don't, you, don't reduce it. You kind of, you'll make the neurology worse. That's actually a load of rubbish. When you think about getting anatomy realigned and back to normal, what you find is you reduce it. Oh, and guess what? The neurology improves. Fractures can make it harder to reduce, but they're not a reason for not reducing. That shoulder still needs to be, to be reduced. So perhaps a slightly different approach than you might get in an emergency room where patients are sent off for x-ray, wait ages, uh, and then need a sedation to, to get it back. If you're going to think about dislocation and do it clinically, make sure you've got the right diagnosis. If you take this gentleman here and you run from his right clavicle out, you'll actually find that it's an ACJ injury. It's not a dislocation. The, 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 the curvature of his shoulder has been preserved and the lumps further up. So make sure before you start pulling on a shoulder, you're not pulling on an ACJ injury. The shoulder dislocation will classically look like that. Uh, and one of the great things, of course, is you've often got well-muscled, slim skiers. Uh, it's a lot easier to make diagnoses in people that aren't grossly obese, uh, which we're increasingly seeing uh, yeah, in, in more conventional settings. The method I don't use, but typically teach, is the Spazo method. This is a fabulous method, and uh, we've done it in my work in Central Australia, where we're doing retrieval coordination and, and remote telehealth support. So working with remote area nurses or somebody on a station who's got no medical training, this method is a fabulous one 
for teaching people who've never done it before. Uh, and I've successfully reduced a few fractures that have been, you know, 500 kilometers away from where I have. Look it up. Uh, if you've got no particular favored method, this one works without an anesthesia and it's very, very easy to teach. And as long as you're patient, it pretty much always works. Another little trick that we've learned is we, we'll see a lot of people who, who, who are boarders that, that uh, fracture their wrists. We're convinced clinically the wrist's fractured. It's tender of the distal radius. For the AP, the lateral and the oblique, oblique look normal. If you switch the round and do what's called a comparative ball catches, so imagine that you've got your hands ready to catch a, a cricket ball or a baseball, uh, and then shoot the films that way around. The one on the right you can see looks clearly different. And I think that's useful because you get it rather than bring them back in a week and then do the same x-rays again, you've got a definitive diagnosis there and then. Uh, and you, you can at least advise people about whether they should go out boarding. You can start, you, you've got a definitive treatment. We'll come to some of the splints that we use. Uh, so you can, you can create a smoother, cheaper, easier post-injury journey for the, for the patient. Scorpions and the thoracal lumbar junction, that's very much of, of interest. That picture is a scorpion, someone's over-rotated. You can see that's probably not good for the neck and it's not good for the thoracal lumbar junction. And the thoracal lumbar junction is a weak point. If you think about your lumbar spine, these are massive, heavy, heavy bricks of bone, aren't they? Uh, and if you think about the, the, the thoracic vertebrae, they're a little bit smaller, but they're all bound to the rib cage and the sternum. So they kind of almost operate uh, as one unit. So where those two meets the weak point. So fractures at T11, T12, L1 are, are where you're looking for, and they're often wedge compression fractures. We typically see then these people going over jumps uh, in the terrain park. They're either overconfident, overshoot, uh, and have a massive landing, perhaps sitting back onto their, onto their backs or, or over rotating. And one of the things when you do your spine exam, there's often no spinal tenderness because all the damage is anterior. Uh, so a lack of spinal tenderness, doesn't mean don't x-ray. It doesn't mean it's not a wedge compression fracture. And I have seen some people present with just chest pain and no back pain. So get the history, suspect the injury, image, and you'll pick it up. And then safe anesthesia. Again, what we do is probably closer to what you might get in an aeromedical retrieval setting uh, with some tweaks. We love regional anesthesia, fascia iliaca blocks, uh, which can be done with quickly without ultrasound. I've done them on slope in, in patients that are still clad. Hematoma blocks are great for long-term pain relief post-reduction. Uh, and we do a lot of facial suturing, so learning some facial blocks. I kind of regard those, those three groups as like an essential skill set. We use beers blocks a lot because it means we could be really busy. We can be under-resourced by any conventional setting, but we've got an awake, physiologically normal patient who we can monitor while we're doing the procedure. And then ketamine sedation as a sort of last resort. Yeah, ketamine is a great, safe pre-hospital drug. Uh, and again, when, you, when you're resource poor, resource limited, it's it's the best of, the, of the, the drugs for procedural sedation and by far the safest. So get familiar. If you're going to be doing any wilderness medicine type stuff, get familiar with some regional anesthesia, get familiar with ketamine. And then a little, other little tips. Yeah, I, I work in hospital and see three or four or five people struggling to put on a back slab uh, against gravity, which is the picture on the left. Uh, quite often, we just turn the patient onto their tummy, which is great for a below knee. Uh, and you can do that on your own. You don't need a bed to put a, put a, a plaster on. That can be done in a wheelchair uh, or even an ordinary chair. And that can be done you know, with perhaps just a couple of people. You might be fighting gravity. But you've got people often, doctors have this fixed thinking about, oh, they need a bed for this. They need a bed for that. And part of working in this sort of environment is, is finding tips and tricks and workarounds so that you can keep working even when everything's busy and full up. Thermoplastic splints are something that have really evolved you know, in the last few years. Stick them in a special oven, heat them up nice and floppy, uh, mold them to the patient, they cool down and become rigid. And with some of our more minor fractures uh, that I mentioned before, that this, this, the one on the left can actually be a definitive treatment really from day one. 
you, they can be loosened off if there's a little bit of swelling uh, and then retightened. Then for a simple undisplaced distal radius fracture in a kid, that's it. They don't need to go to fracture clinic. They don't need to follow up with a doctor. You've done it all on day one. So that's kind of me done. Uh, I've just added some URLs from three previous articles that I've put on the Adventure Medic, which sort of overlap and cover a, a, a fair bit of, of what I've talked about. I rec highly recommend Francesco's book. Uh, there's a good section on Alpine sports medicine in there and a lot of other fabulous stuff as well. Um, and then that was me this winter getting up, going cross country skiing before work. The sun's just risen uh, and all the snow making machines thrusting snow into the air, uh, catching, looking like they've caught fire, but they haven't. So that's me done. And yes, of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert. I know I learned a ton and I'm pretty convinced that I want to work the exact same job <laughs> eventually. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, actually, I'm seeing one pop up right now in the chat. Um, Kendrick Six. asked, preferred method or, or considerations in reducing a shoulder with concurrent arm fracture? So I think that, that that's a good one. You know, I've already talked about doing that pre, you know, the, the reduction without an X-ray, and that's something we typically do. And most of them we get back in. <laughs> if we start, if we start to struggle, it's go. It's like, ah, oh, okay, let's go an X-ray. And while most most of our frat reductions will get in, either a lot of our patients will come in on methoxyfluorine or penthrox, great pre-hospital drug, or nothing. So most of we do without any kind of. Um, uh, yeah, anesthesia. We do it a lot with relax, getting them to relax by talking to them and calming them down and getting them breathing, getting them distracted. But when you get into significant fractures, you're then looking at a procedural sedation with good analgesia. So the two things you're after really are traction uh, and muscle relaxation, and you can achieve that. After that, I think um, you will find it's very I personally think once you've got somebody adequately sedated, and I don't mean morphine and midazolam, I mean ketamine and maybe fentanyl, propofol, fentanyl, it almost doesn't matter what method you use. You can do a bit of massage, you can do a bit of trapezius sort of rotation, a bit of traction, a bit of pushing the, fem you know, the humeral head rather in with your thumb uh, and just do, do whatever works, um, which sounds a bit... I think I'm trying to, I'm not trying to oversimplify it. It's because I think people overcomplicate it. Good procedural sedation, some, any one of those techniques, put them in, bit of counter traction, bit of this, bit of that, wriggle it in and see what works. Most of them will go back. I, I would say, I think you know, in 10 winters, I've had maybe three I haven't been able to do. And one of those had a humeral neck fracture associated with it. So that was never going to go back without an open reduction. The others, they just had, you know, huge big slabs of greater tuberosity off them uh, and we just yeah couldn't do it so they needed open reduction are there opportunities for american doctors to work overseas so i uh, can't speak to other countries uh, australia certainly makes it easier for doctors from the uk ireland new zealand the us and canada to work um, we're as bureaucratic a country as anyone else I would say it's easier for American doctors to work in Australia than it is for Australian doctors to work in America. Um, but there's a lot of paperwork hoops to jump through. You certainly wouldn't be, I would suggest you don't wanna be doing it for less than a year. Paramedics is different. We've only really just got to the point where paramedicine has been recognized as a profession, which I think is horrendous. Uh, to date, they've really been only recognized as paramedics when they've done their training and then are employed in a state-based ambulance service. So there's finally um, some sort of recognition in a college of paramedicine. However, again, very much like the US, the, the, the employment, the certification and the recognition comes at state or territory level. Um, uh, and it can actually be quite difficult even for paramedics to move around within Australia. From some states to others, it's easy, uh, but from but that's not always the case. So for a US paramedic, I mean, look into it, but to what extent your qualifications would immediately be recognized, I couldn't really say. 
common medical calls on the hill, relatively, so if we're talking about out, uh, out of hours, relatively few. And I think that relates to the demographic. It's quite expensive to stay in perisher. So it's wealthier people, families, uh, and those who are working on the hill, which can include young party folk. So we see relatively little. People are generally quite sensible. If they're drunk and break themselves, they usually wait till the morning to come in. Um, whereas down the hill in Jindabyne is where the cheaper accommodation is. And unfortunately, you know, when there's unfortunately drug and alcohol related upset at night, that ends up at Kuma Hospital. We just don't see that, which is a really nice part of being working there. Uh, so really no common medical calls. Full time during the ski season. That's really interesting. Normally, I'd be doing four days a week. Of course, with the COVID season, we just have. We did four days a week for a few weeks. And then we had this big lockdown that worked out its way through New South Wales and the rest of Australia. So it very quickly dwindled to one day a week. And of course, our income is entirely dependent on seeing patients. Uh, there's no sort of salary from anybody. So increasingly, I found myself skiing, not working and not earning. Uh, my job commitment in the summer is purse for me. That's two days a week with the university. Uh, and then I do some fly in, fly out with retrieval in central Australia and some emergency medicine in a small community hospital in Tasmania. Um, so it, it's a bit mixed. I, uh, and again, you know, with the university job, you can't just drop it because you're doing clinical work. So I spend, my, spend a lot of time juggling. So I'm doing this lecture now. Uh, but I've got a late shift in emergency medicine coming up. What sort of opportunities are there in Australia for wilderness extreme medicine electives for medical students? So the program that we have, we provide a um, electives and selective program for our own medical students in our own university. Otherwise, I I've found the Royal Flying Doctor Service can be quite good uh, um, in the various, the various sections, taking students somewhere pretty remote uh, and giving them a very, very different experience. It's partly flying clinic, partly aeromedical. Um, we have our own, our expedition medical ed medicine courses and our maritime medicine courses will take senior medical students on from time to time. Um, so does that answer the question? Is that enough of an answer, Rowena? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Anyone else? I was gonna ask about continuation bias. Is that just when you were talking about continuation bias, are you just talking about uh, remembering to like constantly evaluate the situation instead of running on your original assumption? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Continuation bias is, I mean, it's a bit like I, I, you know, I bring a patient in and I said, well, here's, here's a great, here's a classic one where I managed not to have it. This is in a retrieval setting of a 19 year old Aboriginal lady who'd gone actually into acute pulmonary edema because she had undiagnosed valvular heart disease and uh, preeclampsia uh, just after giving birth. And the patient was sold to me by a physician as bilateral pneumonia. And the whole picture just didn't make sense. So continuation bias would be the physician sold this patient to me as bilateral pneumonia. And I'm fixated on that. That's what it is. And that's what I'm going to treat the patient for. Whereas, you know, stopping the continuation bias, as you say, is reevaluating the information, listening to what you're being told, but not just simply going down that rabbit hole. Okay. Um, okay. Now, there was one question that's popped up just before the, the last one, which I should go back to. The worst, most interesting injury. I mean, the worst is always death, isn't it? So death on the slopes when you're doing CPR under a chairlift. Yeah, everyone's gathering around and, and, and you don't win. That, that's not much fun. Uh, interesting injuries. I think the patients are more interesting than the injuries. After you do this for a while, it, it does get a bit repetitive. Oh, it's, just, it's this, it's that. Um, one interesting patient, and this relates to distracting injury, uh, when you're using your Nexus guidelines, for instance, for clearing things clinically uh, and considering what a distracting injury is, you know, most patients that come in with a femoral fracture are screaming. They're on every, they'll suck up all the medication they can. Uh, we had one soldier come in uh, and he was like, he'd broken his femur 
And the only analgesia he had uh, was the cigarette that he'd rolled himself while he was waiting on the slopes. Uh, and he came in so chilled. And I'm thinking, this guy's special forces. So often it's the, yeah, it's often, you know, and I thought, well, you know, if he's got any other injuries, I, I can rely on this guy because he might have a broken femur, but it's not a distracting injury. So I think for this job, it's often just interacting with some really interesting people rather than interesting injuries. I kind of got started in it when a registrar of mine, uh, when I was doing a lot of teaching down in Tasmania, had moved to Jindabyne. I uh, was doing a, a registrar in, in GP family medicine. And the boss was just looking for another doctor. And she thought, you know, oh, Ellie might be interested. And I went, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Getting started, you know, we had always had the boss in the clinic most days until, you know, we were sort of up and running. Uh, getting that, I already had a good GP and ED skill set. Uh, but yes, it was actually quite a steep learning curve, which is kind of why I've sort of tried to give some, hey, do this before you get started. Think about this sort of stuff. Um, so I think the starting point, again, depends on the context, doesn't it? If you're just on slope uh, and there's no general practice side of it, it's just the injuries. For us, we've got to have a fairly broad skill set. So with students who start as volunteers, ski patrollers, learn advanced first aid, get on the slopes experience, they often stay on after and they qualify some tiers as a volunteer doc. Yeah, I can think of a couple of friends of mine who you know, did ski patrol for years. One became a nurse, one became a paramedic. Yeah, and and yeah, you know, that, that that that's a, that's a kind of great way to sort of, you know, uh, use that to use a wilderness medical society quote is to mix your profession with your passion. I think the remote settings thing is difficult. We find that with our program that we teach. So we have some online units uh, as well as a lot of face to face stuff. And for people that haven't actually ever been in a remote setting, trying to get a hold of what we're trying to teach is so difficult because they just don't get it. If your only emergency experience has been in a department that sees 150 patients a day, several consultants, you know, residents, you know, the whole kit and caboodle is always an MRI scanner. You know, the cardiothoracic doctor comes down if there's chest trauma and, and, and being able to visualize a, a kind of clinic setting where you're just doing everything yourself. Uh, and you might do things a bit differently. You're right, it is is hard. I think a stepping stone is to go to small hospitals. Um, and thinking perhaps to uh, American colleagues, you know, if, you, if you're working in a major city, yeah, you know, there are, I don't know how easy it is, but I'm just thinking about Luann Freer's clinic at Yellowstone. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a bit of family medicine, bit of emergency medicine, quite remote. Getting some experience in, in that sort of setting uh, would be a sort of stepping stone to more remote stuff like this. Favorite ski resort in the US, that's easy. I've visited the US quite a few times. It's always been in summer to climb and hike and I've never actually skied there. So that's still on the tick list. Uh, do I have any avalanche concerns or rescues? So we have, as I said, maritime climate, snowpack stabilizes very quickly. It's relatively warm, relatively windy. We don't get the huge big dumps of snow that you can say in the east side of the Rockies or in Japan uh, or elsewhere in the US where you can get, you know, literally meters of it. So our, our snow stabilizes very quickly. We do get avalanches, particularly back country. More often than not, it's big cornice collapses. So as I say, very windy, you get a lot of uh, snow transport, big cornices building up. They then collapse and destabilize the slope. So we had a couple of deaths out at Blue Lake, that, which was the, one of the pictures I showed right back at the beginning, uh, that was people skiing too close to the edge of the cornice. Threadbows had a couple. There was a guy who died in, a, in an avalanche in a gully. And then ironically, the year later, there was another avalanche in the same gully, but they, they figured that they'd know where to dig uh, because of where the guy was last year. And, and they pulled him out after an hour. So we don't... Australia is a bit dumb because they don't have dogs because it's a national park. So you can't have dogs in national parks. There's that sort of dumb thinking and control of, of what we do. But the reality is, you know, we do not have much avalanche concern. So ski patrollers might not look, look at it, uh, but there's none of the explode, the helicopter bombing, uh, direct, you know, death to, at the first time I've seen deliberate triggering was at the end of this season where one of the big cornices was triggered. Um, 
I, I triggered uh, one deliberately uh, on one of the side country peaks that I knew people would be using a lot. And, and Australian skiers are not necessarily that clued into avalanches. Uh, so, so it's there, but it's not big. If you're going back country, sure, you need to know. Has skiing in Australia been affected by climate change? That's really hard t- to tell. I mean, the easiest answer is going to say it's going to get crap skiing. But the reality over the last decade is we've still seen some really good winters. We get, you know, depending on the La Nina, El Nino thing, we can get better or worse winters. We've just had a, a really, really good winter. And I think what we're seeing is not so much necessarily effects of just warming equals less snow. Very much like the US, uh, you know, we're seeing big changes, big um, disaster types, lots of flooding, bushfires, good snow seasons, um, you know, more hurricanes, more typhoons. So we're getting this disrupted weather pattern stuff rather than just, oh, it's warming, there's less snow. I guess down the track there's going to be, but. The, the chaos of disasters and, and natural disasters is what we're seeing. Uh, physician in Antarctica. Yeah, look, it's not really that off topic. I went cross country skiing when I was there. We, we have a different approach to the US. Uh, our bases are in very different places. So we have four stations. One of those is in the middle of the Southern Ocean on Macquarie Island. The other three are coastal. We take generalist, predominantly generalist doctors, expect them to have some family medicine, some emergency medicine, some anesthetics, and some basic surgery, and we'll upskill them before they go. Increasingly, as as aircraft capabilities are improving and the Antarctic Division is actually cooperating with other bodies, it's getting a bit easier to evacuate people, certainly in the summer um, and even occasionally in the winter. But, but typically the setup is, is a, a self-sufficient station. We train usually three carpenters or cooks or whatever to help uh, in case the theatre needs to be used. Uh, and if there's any sort of significant trauma to be able to help. Uh, We've got really good point of care testing, x-ray, ultrasound, and a very, very well-developed telemedicine sort of setup that allows specialty doctors in in Tasmania usually or Melbourne, and particularly dental, uh, to advise and, and provide some specialist advice on doing those procedures. But for me, there was there was some training, there wasn't much medicine. I, I worked on board the barges, uh, unloading shipping containers and machinery. I truck drove trucks, uh, for unloading oil. I helped clear runways. I guided scientists and film crews. Uh, I did. I helped in the kitchen. Uh, I did all sorts of stuff, but not a lot of medicine, which is good because that's what you want, isn't it? You want to you want to screen and prepare so that there isn't a lot of trouble. You know, people think, oh, in Antarctica, you must have seen a lot of hypothermia and frostbite. No, didn't see any. The name of the show or movie I recommend. Oh, I think that was The Horn right back at the beginning. It's on Netflix. Um, but I'm guessing you should be able to access all of that when it goes up on the Gomi site. Uh, but yeah, The Horn, uh, the Netflix series uh, made by Red Bull. The Horn is the um, the movie from, is that like the Erzurbach-Kravos rescue stuff in Switzerland? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and just as an aside, I don't know if you've heard of the New- University of New Mexico Diploma in Mountain Medicine, but if anyone yeah. is thinking of doing a DIM program, they do have a connection with um, Erzurbat in Switzerland to go out there and do an internship after you complete your DIM through them. I'm just, I did mine as a nurse, and so I'm actually waiting until I finish medical school so I can get a more uh, advanced experience because they have a pretty legit um, 
Mountain Medicine Center there. So just an aside. Perfect, thank well, you. Uh, we might yeah, wrap up. Um, thank you so much for coming and giving us the talk today and thanks for everyone else joining us. Um, we will be announcing the next semester schedule soon, but enjoy some time off and have a good New Year's and holidays. Thank you for the talk, doctor. My pleasure. Thank you and thank you for arranging it. Catherine or Katrina, did you need me to stay on or are you, can I just disappear? Yep, you are all good. We just want to maybe take another second to thank you so, so much. Um, and I will get the recording to you um, in the next few days. Sure. And wh when will it be up on, on, the, on the GOMI site, do you think? That's my end. I'm going to say this weekend because I have an exam in two days. <laughs> oh, there's no hurry. I was, I, was, I was just curious. And good luck with your exam. Thank you. Katrina, I didn't get like word for word the answers to all of the questions, just FYI. No problem. So it's 